Hello everyone, this is Jack the Rambling Raconteur, and I've been uh, doing a fair amount of reading this week. I was hoping to finish Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I've been doing a reread of that, but we had a lot of things going on. We had a plumbing issue, and then I was repairing drywall, and then we had my daughter's birthday party yesterday, so it's been a really busy week. Uh, and I didn't, I'm, I'm not quite finished with their eyes for watching God. That'll probably be a video I'm putting up um, this coming week. Uh, but I did, while allowing drywall putty to uh, dry or allowing paint to dry so I could throw on a second coat, lots of exciting things happening in my house, um, I did jump in and read some, short, some more short stories. And I, I think I showed this uh, the other, last weekend on the video, but I picked up a big volume of um, Guy de Maupassant short stories that I've been digging into and enjoying. He's an interesting writer. He uh, he's sort of um, I, I I think I was introduced to him as sort of the French O. Henry, even though he wrote before O. Henry. So we'll call O. Henry the you know U.S. Uh, Maupassant um, in the sense of stories like the necklace. I don't want to really talk much about the necklace. I don't particularly enjoy it. I think there, some of Maupassant's short stories, like O. Henry's, are built around this one tiny little twist where it's like, gotcha, on the final line or the final paragraph, and it's like, oh, mistaken identity, or we, you know, we thought this, but here's what really happened. Like cheap dime mysteries that, they're good for a quick thrill, and then um, you return to them, and you, can, you know what's going on, and it's not even set up to tell you that it's going to happen. It's just sort of this like gotcha twist and um, I don't particularly enjoy those so I'm not going to talk about the necklace uh, what I do want to talk about is I'm gonna I, I haven't decided what I'm gonna call this one yet if it's gonna be three with Guy or three by Guy but um, there's a group of three of his stories that were grouped together uh, in a Maxwell Fool's film called Le Plaisir or The Pleasure and those are The Mask, Madame Tellier's Establishment and The Model and they reveal uh, different aspects of Maupassant. So he, he has, of course, his sort of Parisian stories, his, uh, I don't want to say Parisian nightlife stories, but some of them are. He also then has these incredibly beautiful pastoral sort of stories or stories set in the French countryside or along uh, the coast of Normandy or sort of small towns in Normandy. And um, I think those sometimes get missed out for the Parisian you know, high society or Parisian low society uh, stories. He, he wrote hundreds of stories and he covers so many different aspects of French society in the late 1800s. I really enjoy them. So I want to I want to dig into those three stories. I'm not going to talk too much about the model. I have just a general issue with it as a reader, as a human, not a fan. Um, but the mask. So the mask is a really good example of how Maupassant can be so kinetic as a writer. And I want to just read um, and, and kind of give a little bit of a taste of, of what his stories can be like. There was a fancy dress ball at the Elysee Montmartre that evening to celebrate Mid-Lent, and the crowd was pouring into the brightly lit passage that led to the dance hall like water into a lock. The overwhelming clamor of the orchestra was bursting through the walls and the roof like a musical storm to spread throughout the neighborhood, arousing in the streets and even in the depths of the nearby houses that irresistible desire to jump about, keep warm and have fun, which slumbers deep in the human animal. And then uh, on the next page, this is, to me, this is one of those things that's very, very hard to do in write, as a writer. One of them who was performing and talking about dancing, one of them who was performing in the most famous of the quadris in place of a celebrated dancer, the handsome Song Agos, and doing his best to keep up with the indefatigable Arete de Vaux, was executing some peculiar solo steps which the onlookers were greeting with ironic laughter. He was a thin man, dressed as a dandy, and wearing a handsome varnished mask, with a fair mustache and a curly wig. He looked rather like a wax dummy from the Musée Grévin, a curious caricature of the charming young man in the fashion plates and he was dancing with an earnest but awkward energy, a comical frenzy. He seemed rusty in comparison with the others, as he tried to imitate their capers, as stiff and clumsy as a mongrel playing with greyhounds. Sarcastic cheers egged him on, and drunk with enthusiasm, he leaped about so frantically 
that all of a sudden, carried away by a wild rush, he ran straight at the wall of onlookers, which opened to let him through, then closed again around the dancer's motionless body, lying flat on his face. And so, if you've ever seen Moulin Rouge or, or either the 50s one or the more recent one from I think, late 90s, um, you have that sense of what those dance halls can be like, with people just spinning and dancing. And Maupassant on those first couple of pages just absolutely captures what that was like to be there in that moment with that movement. And that is so hard to do. And he gives us this character's, uh, a glimpse of this character who's, who's wearing a mask. And unlike O. Henry in many of his stories or Maupassant in the third of his stories that just feel kind of tossed off, you know, for, for the papers, uh, just like get it out there. Um, the twist comes on the very next page, like two paragraphs after, after I stopped reading, which was on the second page, the twist comes in the story and there's another 10 pages to go. So we're not, we're not given sort of this cheap gut shot, you know, punch at the end of the story where everything we thought has suddenly been changed. Um, instead we're given the twist, right? We are given this moment, this frenzy, and then we're given the twist. And then Maupassant uses that to show us that that man, that sort of rusty dancer, we find out why he's rusty. We find out who he was. We find out about the woman he loved. We find out about how his life changed. And, and I think that's what makes the story so incredible is Maupassant uses this great little set piece for three pages to then shine a prism and say, you know, our lives can change in a moment. Um, the twist was not the moment that changed that character's life, it's something else. And, and the comfortable situations that we find ourselves in uh, can hang by threads that can be cut at any moment. And that's really what the mask reveals. And it, it reveals how hard it can be for people to change when their circumstances have changed or to change their decisions and actions when their lives have changed. And it's a great little story. Uh, the second story is one of Maupassant's best stories, in my opinion. Um, and it's a really fascinating story. <laughs> so it's it, it's set in three different parts and the first and last sort of bookend, this long central piece, but the first and last parts um, show the, uh, the, the same setting. So it's we're in a seaside town in Normandy and it's a house of ill repute. I'm going to try and use that type of euphemism for, uh, you know, the same censors Maupassant and O'Fools were worried about. Um, there's a house of ill repute. Madame Tellier owns it and runs it. Her, she's not the original owner of it. She's never worked in it, like, as a worker who rose up to build her own establishment. She's just a niece of an aunt and uncle who decided to buy this place and create it. And it was profitable, so she took it over when they grew old and died. Um, we're, we're, the women who work there are described. None of them are necessarily conventionally beautiful women. We... We're not, um, we're not objectifying the women necessarily, but it, it's a very comic story. So of course we, we start with the different men in the town who frequent it trying to come in and there are French and English sailors like banging on the bar that's on the lower floor. And the, there's at six or seven men who are of all of different middle-class, upper middle-class backgrounds. There's one who's younger in his twenties, but others are as old as in their fifties, maybe early sixties. There's a former mayor. There's like an insurance man I mean they're just from all over the walks uh, and they all are there and the whole place the lights are off the whole place is closed they can't figure out why the uh, bourgeois men no one sort of find a place to sit down they get in arguments and they're rude to each other and you just generally like they just seem like people you wouldn't really want to go to a dinner party with or spend much time with um, they seem incapable of really positive affirmation conversation <laughs> affirming conversation um finally it turns out there's a note on the on one of the windows that says closed for first communion obviously that's ironic with Maupassant the irony is very unsubtle it is explicit it's to him and to many of his readers it's hysterical that the women who work in this place in Madame Tellier's establishment are going to a first communion they that's that's how can you be funnier than that? Um, and so then we jump and we go from this seaside town and, and the establishment there. And we're on a train with the women earlier that morning. I mean, it's 
it's just a great time jump and shift in the story. And we're on the train going. Maupassant gives us this scene where uh, an elderly couple who are, you know, sort of poor get on the train or riding in the carriage with these women and don't really get the situation. And then this really creepy salesman shows up. He might be, he's, he's one of probably the two most unpleasant characters in the entire story. He's trying to sell these women garters. He's an absolute creep. Um, he makes everybody else uncomfortable and, you know, get, get, get him off the carriage. <laughs> I would never want to interact with this person, like, you know, in, in, a, in a public setting <laughs> where he was behaving that way. You, you would want to just immediately be like, cut it out. Um... So we, we end up then in the village where Madame Tellier's brother lives. We get this beautiful scene where one of the one of her workers is sleeping alone in a small, like almost like cupboard type thing. The daughter of the family who's gonna be going to the communion, she's sleeping alone and is afraid because that never happens. And so she ends up coming in and being like comforted by uh, by the woman who has been sleeping on her own. And it's a really lovely scene. And then we go into the church and we get what I think Maupassant intends as deep irony and sort of just this very cynical take. And um, as a reader, I don't have to join the cynical take. <laughs> I can have my revisionist take on it. So there's they start the communion and then this passage occurs. It was then that Rosso, one of the workers, her face buried in her hands, suddenly remembered her mother, the church in her village, and her own first communion. She felt as if she were living that day again, when she had been such a little girl, lost in her white dress, and she started to cry. At first she wept quietly, the tears welling slowly from her eyes, but then as her memories crowded in on her and her emotion grew, she burst out sobbing, her throat swelling and her bosom heaving. She took out her handkerchief, wiped her eyes, dabbed at her nose and mouth to stifle her cries, but all in vain. A sort of groan came from her throat, answered by two other deep, heart-rending sighs for her two neighbors, Luis and Flora, overcome by similar memories of a distant past, were also moaning and weeping floods of tears, as tears are contagious. And it just goes on where the, the you know, this one woman's crying, and then the two next to her are crying, and then the whole pew starts crying. And then it just kind of sweeps through the church, the choir is weeping. And we get to the, the minister, um, Suddenly, a kind of madness seemed to sweep the church, a noise like that of a frenzied crowd, a storm of sobs and muffled cries. It passed like one of those gusts of wind which bend the trees in a forest, and the priest, standing motionless with a wafer in his hand, paralyzed by emotion, said to himself, This is God in our midst, manifesting his presence, descending upon his kneeling people in answer to my voice. There's the irony. And he stammered frantic prayers, forgetting the words, the prayers of a soul straining fervently towards heaven. And he, he later says, he goes, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You have just given me the greatest joy I have known in all my life. And it's, it's astonishing how it's clearly meant to be ironic that the women who work in Madame Tellier's establishment start weeping, and then the whole church weeps, and the priest thinks that it's, you know, um, God responding to his uh, his priestly invocation, and it's evident that that's not what what ha what has stimulated any of this emotion. But it's a very beautiful scene to be taken into the mind of a character, and to to reveal all of that. Um, the 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 story then closes with uh, the women going back to the establishment, the men finding out that it's back open and rushing to be over there, and um, and we we see that the the characters really have not necessarily changed. But for one hour, in a sense, there's this glorious moment where they're, they're all feeling the same emotion. They're, they're different perspectives, all sort of like centered together like the center of a spider's web. And there's just this great moment within it before they then go off to their separate walks of life without necessarily being changed by the moment. And it doesn't make the moment any less beautiful. Um, the final story is the model. and not a huge fan of it. It involves, uh, Maupassant as a narrator, basically, like, as Maupassant, is just telling this story to a friend, uh, when they see an artist walking, you know, along the seaside there. But as a story, I don't think it holds up quite well. 
it involves characters who think they've fallen out of love, but they haven't. It, it's not that love has soured. They were never in love. It was a, they had a romance and the romance soured, but they never truly loved each other, in, in my opinion. It wasn't the love that soured. And then that would be enough, that type of vignette. But what we end up with instead is a character who's trying to instigate self-harm and another character who's overcome. And it's not only unpleasant, it, it's never really condemned by anyone who sees it happening. There's this pity afterwards where the, the pair sort of agree to live in this awful purgatory or inferno of their own making, but it, it's it's a deeply unpleasant story. I I probably won't be rereading it. Um, I, I didn't like it the first time I read it. I didn't really enjoy a reread of it. It's my least favorite part of Les Plaisirs. Uh, and, and really, it's, it's just because of um, the subject matter is not something I, I want to be revisiting. So those are three with Guy. Uh, the Mask, excellent. Madame Taylor's Establishment, not only an excellent Maupassant story, but probably one of the best, I don't know, hundreds of short stories in existence. And then The Model, read it if you desire to. I, I won't recommend it. Um, but I'll be back very soon, hopefully with uh, an update on Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. So thank you, BookTube. <laughs>